So we're talking about institutions today, and um, it's not, I'm honest, I mean, we're talking about sound, basically all of today's period has to do with sound, but some of the concepts that we're going to apply to doesn't only apply with sound, it applies to everything with, with, that behaves like a wave. So even like water ripples to a certain extent, will do um, these kinds of behaviors. We're going to talk about sound because it's very convenient, right? We know a lot about sound. We apply sound all the time. You guys hear sound all the time. You listen to music, you watch movies, and um, it's quite important in our lives. So it's a convenient example to use. But just bear in mind that any wave can be uh, described the way I'm going to describe it. So we're going to talk about constructive and destructive interference. You guys should know what that is already. Constructive is when you what do the waves? What do you do with the waves? Add them. And uh, destructive would be when you subtract them, right? And it's it's a bit more complicated than that because sometimes you can add waves and get destructive interference. So here's an example. So I'm going to ask you guys to add wave one with wave two and tell me which one of these um, is going to be the resulting wave. So think about it for a moment. Do you have an answer? Yeah. Back to the next. D. I want to agree with that. Where'd you say D? Can you tell me? Exactly. So here I'm adding these two waves together, and you saw that by adding the waves together, I got both destructive interference and constructive interference. Right? So the destructive interference, because they subtracted the loop, and constructive interference, they added up and they got um, they got a bigger, bigger amplitude. Okay. Any questions on that? Really, the basis of what we're doing today. Supposing I had two speakers playing the same exact frequency, all right? And this one's playing it first, let's say, and it's going to, I'm, I'm actually be honest. Um, the first speaker is playing first, and it's going to have a wave that kind of looks like this in that direction. Right? Now, what would happen if this speaker played the exact same frequency and that the distance between them was one wavelength of distance. So let's draw and see what that happens. I'm going to do it in a different color. So I'm going to draw the same wave because they're playing the same frequency. I'm going to draw the same wave starting there. And I'm telling you that there's exactly one wavelength difference between them in terms of distance. So look, there's one wavelength difference. So what happens? What kind of interference did I get? Back? Yeah, in this case, I got constructive interference because you're totally and utterly in phase. Right? Let's restart. There's my wave for the first um, for the first speaker. And now I'm telling you that the distance between these two speakers is half a wavelength. All right, so let's draw what happens. Who can guess what's going to happen? In here? Destructive interference. All right, so let's see if that's the case. And indeed it is. All right, so every single, um, this, this red wave is totally out of phase with the blue wave that I created. And so at all points, they're going to be destructive interference. Did I talk to you guys about um, noise canceling headphones? Yeah, talk to you guys about it? No, you said no. Anyways, just if I, if I did or didn't, it doesn't matter. The basic concept is that your noise canceling headphones are going to record the sound that's coming into it and just play a sound out of phase um, exactly equal to it, but in opposite phase. Um, into your ears so that you don't hear white noise. It works really well in airplanes and places where there's a lot of white noise, but uh, not. it doesn't really cut out like people talking because it cannot predict the waves coming out of someone's mouth. It's going to try to do it, 
but for the most part, it's not going to be able to. Yeah. Let's try. So if I have a wave that looks like, I'm going to do three quarters. Is that okay? So it's going to be. Uh, I don't know if I did it perfectly, but that's the idea. So what do you get in this case? Get constructive or destructive or something in between? You get something in between. And if you want, you can add these two waves up, right? Uh, it's a matter of uh, doing wave, let's call this one wave one, and this one's called wave two. It's just a matter of adding wave one and wave two. So here, are you going to get uh, a low or a, or a zero or a high? What do you think you're going to get at this point here? This vertical, so if you add a wave one and wave two, it's going to be a low. And then, so you can, at this point, let's say you might get a, a nothing. And at this point, you have two waves that are up there, so you might have something up here. So here you'll have like a peak. Right, so you have a really bright, uh, not bright, but the loud sounding noise if you're standing right here. And that, uh, this has to do with how far these two speakers are. They really do. With the limiting variable that these two speakers are playing different frequencies, all we're talking about is the distance between the two speakers. And that'll determine whether there's going to be constructive or destructive at the end. So if it was one wavelength, we get constructive or destructive. Constructive. If I had two wavelengths, do I have constructive or destructive? Constructive again. And any multiple of an entire wavelength, right, is going to give me constructive um, interference. And so let's find uh, the relationship if I want to get destructive interference. It has to be at a half. So half is um, destructive interference. When's the next time? What's the next wavelength I'm going to get destructive interference? One and a half, and then the one after that, two and a half, three and a half. So basically, it's some number n plus a half multiplied by the wavelength of distance between these. We're going to have a, a slide showing you that equation. We're going to talk about it. But here it is explaining it. If I didn't explain it to you um, well enough, um, the idea that the distance between the two speakers is what's important. And this is called the distance between the two is called the path length difference. Okay? All right, um, like I said, if the path length difference is a multiple of the wavelength, then you're gonna get constructive interference. If the path length difference is a multiple of the wavelength plus a half, then it's gonna be destructive interference. And the equations are, this one is describing what I just said. The equations are right here. So if the path length is a multiple term of the wavelength, that's constructive interference, it could be anything. Zero, it's hard to be an integer number, but it could be anything. And the same thing for constructive interference. So now you have this one half um, point. This only only works if the two frequencies of the sounds are the same, or if the wavelengths same thing as. Frequency in this case, because the speed of sound doesn't change in a given medium. Right? It only works if the wavelengths of the frequencies are different. Right? So we're going to do an example later called beats, where the frequencies are going to be different. But for now, we're sticking with same frequency um, for both speakers. So far, so good?
Okay. So um, I want to do some examples. Um, let's do this one. It's a very simple one. Read it. Try it. We'll solve it together in about, let's say, five to seven minutes. What was the first step some of you guys took? Yeah, very good. Find a wavelength. We know that velocity is equal to frequency times lambda. We have velocity, we have frequency, we can find lambda. We have, we were explicitly given D1. Can we find D2? Yeah, because we got the total distance between them. So we have the total distance is equal to 42 meters minus, oh, it's 42 meters, not minus. And so D1 plus D2 has to be equal to 42. So 19.5 X is going to give you 42. Therefore, x is equal to twenty-two point five. What is the next step? At this point, I have D1 and D2, so I can find the, yeah, the path length difference. So let's do that. So the delta D is equal to, I'm just going to do a big minus small so I can get a positive number. In reality, it doesn't matter which one you use. Thank uh -huh. 
now we can figure out. Somebody smells really good. Is someone drinking tea? Nope. That smells good. So the next step would then be to find out if this is a full integer multiple of the wavelength or an integer plus half integer um, multiple of wavelength. So which one is it just by looking at it? Full integer. So right, this is delta D is equal to some uh, integer value M, we're going to call it, multiplied by the wavelength. The wavelength is 3 meters. And I'm going to use it as a variable. And your delta D is 3 meters. So M is equal to 1. So do you have constructive or destructive? Constructive. I'm going to try something. I have no idea if you guys are willing to try it. Someone to go at the back there uh, with their laptop. Can anyone do it? <laughs> the person who does, um, navigate, sort of Google the terms um, tone generator. Google Tone Generator. Not loud enough. Set it to uh, 800. And make your, your laptop face the front. And I'll make my laptop face the front. We're going to walk down here to see if we can get that perception of destructive or destructive in the front. It's going to be annoying, right? It's 800 hertz. It's not high pitch because we could hear up to 20,000 hertz. do it today but um kind of this afternoon coming in time so next week we'll do it and uh we'll have to have that app or one of you on your group will have to have it uh, okay let's go back to this any questions hold on don't start this one yet just because i don't want to waste you guys time too much on repetitive problems Two speakers. Yeah, I do this problem. It's beneficial. So what you need to know here is that the two speakers are side by side, and you're standing in front of one. All right. One speaker, and this is two. 
speaker one, speaker two. So if, these, if this distance here was 3 meters, I think that's what it says, and this distance is 4 meters, doesn't that give you a special triangle? Yeah, it's the rectangular triangle, 3, 4, 5 triangle. Have you guys heard of that? I don't know. It's not here. So this here, this distance has to be 5 meters. It's not really drawn to scale. So. So this is strange because now the path length difference is not, I mean, it is very straightforward, but you might not think of it as straightforward because they're, they're coming at you at different angles. And so this one's going to send you a wave like this, and this one's going to send you a wave like this. Can you use the same uh, path length density formula? Yes, you can. It's the exact same thing. It's not a vector, so you don't need to know which direction it's coming from. So your delta D is going to be 5. 0 meters minus 4.0 meters. What's the wavelength? Can you guys do that in your head? Two meters. It should be two sig figs. I'm just going to add it. The delta D is equal to either m times lambda or delta d is to m plus one half times lambda. So we're going to try m. <clears throat> so if we're going to try the first one first. If it gives us a decimal number, we just know it's the other one. So there's no point of even doing the second. Delta d is 1.0 meters is equal to m times 2. So m is equal to 0 0.5. Constructive or destructive? Destructive, so it's going to be a local size. Okay. I'm not gonna do this problem with you, but I just want to ask you guys: If I wanted to find a path length difference, do I need to care about the direction that it's coming from? No. 9.5 minus 8.5, you get your value for the path length difference divided by the wavelength. And if you get a full integer number, it's constructed. If you get a half integer number. This is the last topic on the class, okay? So that's when I told you guys that this is going to be. Um, this is going to be. Just the beginning part for the test. This is going to be on it. The stuff that we're going to do beyond this is not. Okay. Take the time. There's a couple more problems here. Uh, you don't. I don't want you guys to do them now because they're they're actually quite lengthy. Um, if you have any questions on them, just let me know. What I might do is actually just solve the answers and put them there and post them up on the website. Um, probably do that today or tomorrow. Okay. All right. So let's exit this.
Let's talk about wave superposition now, which is again, a fancy way of saying the exact same thing. So you're gonna find this one's gonna be super short and very intuitive. You can ignore this section 11.7. I took these slides from, uh, I remember where, and they had, uh, they were using a textbook. We're not using Okay. So, I want to keep talking. This is a really cool video. That is so to these people. It explains so much. This is a sort of old school demonstration of superposition of waves uh, using some different colored beads and some plastic molds here. Uh, one wave is shown here, uh, the original red wave, as it were. Um, any, anything shown as these red beads is going to be the sum of this original wave and whatever I insert with this plastic here. And what, what this plastic guide will do is it will tell these green beads how high up to go. And if I line it up just right, we're going to get what we call constructive interference, and you're going to get an amplification of the red total. And if I, uh, if I put this original wave out of phase with the new one, you're going to get destructive interference, and they'll cancel out. So right now, uh, notice that the original wave shown on the beads has a peak at this first black reference point, and a trough at the second one, and a peak at the third one, and so on. So if I insert this guide in here, and this is very old, so I have to be careful about that. All right. What I have now is the green guides are replicating exactly what the red wave was like before I added the second wave, if that makes any sense. So if you, if you notice the red wave now, the amplitude is much bigger. It's much uh, taller from peak to valley. And that is because this guide, therefore the green wave and the original red wave are in phase with each other and they add constructively. If I shift this over half a wavelength though, if I make this green peak, if I make that happen here, right, you can see in the cases where there's clean overlap, the sum total is now flat at zero. Because if you remember originally the red wave used to have a peak here and a trough here. And I'm adding to that a wave that has a trough here and a, and a, and a peak here. Those wind up canceling each other out. You get destructive interference. We say that, the, uh, that this green wave and the red wave that was there originally at that moment were 180 degrees out of phase. Now, uh, you can also, with this bit of demonstration, uh, add other waves to this, like this one. Uh, this wave has a wavelength that's uh, one half this original one. So you will never get perfect amplification or cancellation, but it'll show that if you add waves of two different wavelengths, you can get a sum, which is a little more complicated in shape. And that's, that's what we're getting with the red bees now. All right. So uh, back to this. So we're going to talk about that. We're, 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 I mean, it's continuing the same topic of constructive and destructive interference. But now we're going to do things that are not just either in phase or out of phase. They're just going to be any phase. We're not going to do this mathematically because, quite honestly, it's not um, it's not easy. It's very complicated. But um, once you learn the new math tools that you'll get next year and beyond, you can turn into you know, five scientists. You'll, um, you'll learn, you'll learn that full math that you need to do to do it. So here I have a um, regular sine wave with a very high low frequency. High frequency is a very 
focus of this, right? I'm going to add these two waves up, and you see that the overall shape of the sinusoidal function is now following the shape of this wiggle. Right? The A is following like right here to take A, and then phase up go on plus B. Right? And it's really simple to see how that works when you have something that has such a uh, big wavelength and such a low frequency, and a high frequency, right? Low frequency. Um, it really is a matter of just adding up the waves. So what you guys should be able to do is, uh, at this level is take a value of each wave, add them together and find some kind of sum value, right? So if I gave you the equation for wave one and I give you the equation for wave two, you plug in your time, let's say, you want to complete the same time because you want to know what the value of the wave is at a specific point. You can figure out um, what the amplitude, not the amplitude, but the Y value is of your wave at that time. Okay. When we hear, when you guys hear me talk, that's exactly what's happened, right? So I'm modulating my voice and I'm using different tones, different sounds, different words, different letters. And the combination of that is like a, an enormous amount of complexity uh, that you can theoretically break down into very simple, like regular sine waves. Um, have you guys learned a program called MATLAB? Or have you heard of the term MATLAB? Or like some of your friends, if you're on applied, they definitely did it in programming. Um, it's a it's a really sophisticated program used to uh, do math. And actually, a lot of brainwave activity is broken down into regular sine waves using that program. Um, it's called Fourier transformations. It's really cool. If you guys ever take a neuroscience class, the like remember this stuff. You just kind of come back to you full full fledged. Full speed. Um, again, talking about uh, eyes, ears, brain activity, all of it is happening. So, again, if I have now one this wave, this wave, and this wave, and this kind of complicated pattern, and this is what it looks like when you're in sleep. Right? You can imagine that it's really, really not as simple as adding three regular sine waves, it's like adding hundreds and hundreds of different sine waves together. You're getting this kind of feature. And this this is changing every second. So this is just if I go left, that would be like a little bit of I don't know if you've ever recorded your, your yourself on a computer sound um, application like uh, yeah. Well what which program the microphone? Okay, yeah. So exactly. And any microphone app that you use is gonna if you just make one sound, it'll be this. But now imagine my entire sentence and my entire speech, everything that I say, you say, you hear, whatever, is a huge wave like this. Theoretically, you can break it down into waves, but practically speaking, you would need a huge amount of computing power to do that. Questions? Did I tell you guys about the, um, the lab in at McGill University working on acoustics? Yeah, pretty cool what they do there. And essentially, it breaks it down into this. One of the projects that they were working on was how to artificially create the most natural sounding uh, acoustic guitar that they can. So by using digital sounds, try to get it so that it matches the frequency of, uh, of an acoustic regular analog guitar. So they have it recorded, they have a regular acoustic guitar recorded, and they break down the waves and try to match the waves with digital waves um, so that you can create like digital instruments that are very realistic sounding. I think I crack at this one. Try doing it in your notes. Yeah. If the red wave is just a regular sine wave that has a higher amplitude, it can be a negative sine wave with a stronger amplitude or half the amplitude. You can recreate that. What I want you guys to do is try to create what's the resultant if I add these two waves together.
the resultant wave, is it a sine wave? More specifically, what kind of sine wave? Positive or negative? It's going to be a positive sine wave, and it's going to have an amplitude equal to the red one or the blue one. We're closer to the blue one. If we consider that the red one is double that of the blue one, you can see they're totally out of phase, right? So the blue one is going to be 100 percent efficiently constructed in the sense of red wave, but because the red wave has a bigger amplitude, you can't do it at 100 percent. So my resultant wave looks something like. Wow. How's your sine wave drawing skills coming along? You've been practicing? Like as a teacher, my ability to draw graphs have gotten better because doing this 4,000 times a day makes it so that I can draw really straight lines. Maybe not on a computer, but on paper, it's much easier. All right. Um, let's do this one. You have a wave going to the right and a wave going to the left. And what's going to happen when the two waves meet? So what you need to do first is draw where the waves, where each individual wave is going to be at each of these time intervals. You have their velocities, you have your initial position. So figure out where they're going to be. And if they overlap, you'll have to add that part together or subtract it if they're uh, not to the right. If they're in opposite sides of the x-axis, sorry. At which time point, or if any, do you get total constructive um, interference? 
Yeah, 25, at 0.25 seconds, you get total constructive interference. The reason for that is because if you notice, each of the waves have traveled 10 centimeters in their respective directions after 0.25 seconds. So this wave here, that's this wave after moving 10 centimeters. And this one we will move 10 centimeters, and that wave looks like this. So you get total constructive and interference because they're right on top. All right. Anything before and after that is just going to be less constructive. It's still constructive interference, but not, not to its maximum potential. I'm going to draw one of the other ones. This one, okay. This is the uh, 10 centimeter one. So the resultant wave is going to be something like. Something like that. That would be the result of wave two at point twenty five seconds. Is it normal that it goes above this one line here? Did I do that correctly or should it not have traveled? Should what? It's good? Yeah, it should go over because this one is at about 0.8 or I don't know, 0.8, and this one's at about 0 0.5 and 0.8 plus 0.5 is 1.3. So it's okay that I will talk to. Let's see what happens if I if I drew the other one. I'm going to do the uh, six centimeter one. So the peak here is at ten. I would have to draw the peak at sixteen, which is about here. Like that. And this one is the same thing. I move it, and the peak should be at twenty four because if I'm at thirty and I move six centimeters this way, that means my peak should now be at twenty four, which is about here. So I guess something like this, right? And there's really only, if I drew this correctly, I'm assuming I'm not perfect, but I'm assuming it's correct, let's say, I'm only getting constructive interference here, because that's the only part of my uh, wave that's, um, that's adding up. So what I'm gonna get is something that looks like this. Because here the two waves they had a I mean maybe it maybe it wasn't enough to show a visible bump, but there's for sure constructive interference happening only there. And that's why yep, see it's this, this one's going this way, this one's going this way, and at, at 0.15 seconds, only this part of the waves have touched the center. We can do the last one too. Can I erase it? No. Yep. Yep. Okay. Can I erase it? So again, now I know that my peak has moved 12 centimeters. So my when it was a peak of a 10, now it's going to be a peak of 22. So it's going to look like this. Okay. Correctly. And this one is going to be at so that 30. Now it's going to be at Right. Right. And it's actually going to look like the same thing, but the other way around. Because now they pass each other, and um, the waves are going to look something like
Any questions on this? Pretty straightforward, I, I think. Um, well, we talked about this. I'll let you guys watch this if you want. The video is not amazing, but it does uh, give you a good idea. Let's take a five minute break. Come back at uh, 11 <laughs>
All right, let's get started. Uh, just before I continue, reminds me, uh, I do need help for open house on the 15th, the evening of. Uh, the school promises uh, food for you guys, and I promise you guys a good time with the um, spending time in the physics lab. You get to play with some of the cool experiments. Last year, we had a blast. Um, Max played music the whole night. It was actually pretty, it was cool, in my opinion. Uh, the, the people really liked it. There was always a lot of people there. Um, if you're interested, uh, I definitely need your help. So you're doing me a huge favor, and also you're helping out the school. Uh, it's a great way to give back to your school if you feel like you need to give back to your school. Uh, yep, uh, Thursday. There is already two people who have said yes. I need more people though. So if you want to come, it was Yael and I think it was Hila so far. You can come. Can you convince others? Because I know you have that ability. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so beats. That's the next um, topic I want to talk about. And no, I don't mean beats the headphones by Dr. Dre. Uh, which, by the way, aren't very good. I don't know if you're buying them and spending all that much money. They're not considered to be high quality headphones. Uh, I recommend this company called Shure. Bose is also good, but again, very expensive. Um, have you ever, who drives to school or drives? Have you ever sat at an intersection and your indicator's on and your person in front of you, their indicator's on and you're looking to see when they match and sometimes they get out of phase and then they get back into phase? That's exactly what a beat is, by the way. It's when something that's like a wavefront matches their, um, matches like a part of their wave and other parts not matching and it matches again and parts of it match. Um, think of it like that. Um, we're going to do a demo first. Uh, da, 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 da. Max, could you go to the back and take your laptop with you? Google the term tone generator. All right. And once you do that, the first link should give you a, a page that looks like this one that you see at the front. Tell me when you're ready. Ready? Okay, so I want you to set your frequency to 804 hertz. And put it on the table and put it here and place the contact here at night. Can you guys have it?
and it is that is sure that b right the b you're gonna hear Is that 804? Oh, yeah, 404. Oh, yeah. frequency that you're playing? Ah, okay. So what do you want to play? Yeah, so Max was playing 404. I was playing 402. And this just so happened to be that number. It's not like, right? Um, so the difference in the frequencies gives us the peak frequency. Right? So um, whatever the frequency is. 
If I were to change this to um, 400, would that number go up or down? It would go up. Can we just play so we can see that the difference maybe? Maybe we can hear it. Perfect, thank you. You can take your stuff back. So here are the two ways that are very close in frequency, but not necessarily. Um, the same. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be close either, which is very far apart. It's just the numbers are going to be crazy hard to, to determine. But if you see, like the waves start being in phase, and then here they're out of phase, out of phase, out of phase, out of phase, and totally out of phase around there, right? And then as they slowly get back, da, 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 and they go back into phase at another point. Yeah? The fact that you're here is there doesn't really matter, right? Ignore that for now. But just the fact that they're in phase in some places. Totally out of phase and others, and back to in phase in this location. And if you were to add the waves up, you would have something that looks like this. Right? And then here is where you have where they're totally lined up, and here's where they have where they're totally lined up, and here's when they're totally out of phase. All right? And um, if you were to look at this on a bigger scale, I wonder if I have a better picture. If I had it, so it's something that's a really crappy picture, but it, it shows my point a little bit more clearly. If you look at this, right, there's clearly how many beats do you see here? So imagine that there's a high and a low. So at this point here, there's total constructive interference. At this point, there's constructive and there's constructive. So how many beats do you see? Yeah, you have two beats here, okay? Even though your wave went up and down like crazy, a lot of things. It's really these big peaks that we're looking at. This sort of beat here. Okay, so I'm going to go back again. Um, so this is what we, this is the activity we just did. Um, it's I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think we got what we needed from this, and uh, we figured out that the beat frequency we're going to call this F B is equal to the difference between the two frequencies F one minus F two. So F minus f1 it doesn't matter it's the difference between the two you can put an absolute value sign around them if you want because if it's 404 and 400 versus 400 and 404 it's still going to give you the same beat frequency FB is equal to the absolute value of F2 minus F1. I'm going to attempt to prove this to you guys. That'll be one of the proofs, I guess, in the course. There's very many of them. I have a book of proofs. Um, I'm going to draw two ways. Do I have space? Yeah, actually, I'm going to use this. Use that. Okay. So we're trying to prove that the beat frequency is equal to F1 minus F2 or F2 minus F1, it doesn't matter. We're going to have two waves here, a red one and a blue one. And I want to point your attention to the first cycle. So this is, we're going to look at actually, we're going to start it um, right here. We're going to start counting right here just to make it more convenient for us. Uh, at that point where my arrow is, they're in phase total. Okay. And after one cycle, after the red one has done one cycle and the blue one has done one cycle, the difference between them, I'm going to call that delta t. Okay. And that's the, phase, the time phase shift between the two uh, waves after only one cycle. Who's a really fast runner here? Who's like a marathon runner or a sprinter or something? Who is? You're right? 
you don't compete. But okay, who plays a sport where they have to run a lot? Okay, all right. So you guys, you're gonna be my benchmark. Okay, so you guys run fast. I don't. All right. So um, let's say let's say you guys run twice the speed of me. All right. After one second, your distance between us, a uh, distance between you and me, is going to be let's say ten meters. All right. That's the distance between us after one second because you run twice as fast. All right. Um, kind of unrealistic now that I think about it. That's how slow I am, guys. All right. Uh, after two seconds, what's going to be the distance between them and me? 20 meters. After three seconds, it's going to be 30 meters. All right. So that's the difference between how fast. So that's the same kind of thing here. We're not talking about how fast the waves are going. Uh, the second wave cycle, what's the di time difference between them? It's larger, but how much larger? Twice as large as the first one. Okay, so let's work on that. Here we have two times delta t. Okay, so that's the gap is twice as big. And over there, what's the time difference? Four times delta t. And then here, it's going to be five times delta t. Eventually, if, if these fast guys and I run around a circular lap, what's going to happen eventually if they're running so much faster? They're going to catch up with me on the second lap, and I'm still going to be on my first lap. Or it might not be on my first lap. Maybe it'll be on the fourth lap. Or it doesn't matter which lap it happens. But at some point, if they run faster than me, they're going to catch up to me and lap me again. So look at this wave here. So if we're talking about the blue wave, right? This is the first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, fourth cycle, fifth cycle, sixth cycle, and that's for the blue one. For the red one, we're going to go with first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, fourth cycle, fifth cycle. So the fifth red cycle and the sixth blue cycle are going to overlap. Yeah. Oh, it's because I'm stupid. It's no, it's this must be three, four, and then this next one. Yeah, it's I just skipped over. No, yeah, it's like saying like um, after one second you're ten meters ahead of me, after two seconds you're twenty, after three thirty, after four forty. Yeah. I was just misspoke. So now they catch up after n cycles. All right. We don't know. We were trying to figure out what that n is. How many cycles it takes for it to um, to catch up to make one lap? Just trying to make sure that I have everything correct so far. So I want to know how many multiples of one of these cycles is going to give me so that the difference between the two. Right, so that my next delta t is going to be exactly one period so that they're back on phase. All right, so I'm going to say that um, n delta t is going to give me t1. All right, so basically, how many multiples of my delta t would be so that the difference between them ends up being a whole period? All right. So far, so good. So once this delta t multiplied by some integer value, or maybe not an integer value, because it's not always going to be. Uh, so by a difference in time, at which point, after how many delta t is it going to match one whole period so that I'm one full um, period behind it and we're back into sync? All right, now let's define what um, delta t is real quick. So delta t, we're going to call that t2 minus t1. So far, so good. 
We also have to define what n is. If, it, if one of my periods is, let's say, 10 seconds, and it took, um, and it took six cycles for it to, to, to get to back into sync, how many cycles did I need to, what, what would be my n value? Six, right? So if I had to define n, oops, I already wrote my n equal. If I had to define my n, as the amount of time, regular time, I'm not talking about multiples of time, but if I'm talking about the, the amount of time it takes divided by each period, so I can find out how many multiples of periods it takes, okay, I can rewrite my n like this, right? So how many multiples of, um, of, uh, of my second period does it take to reach the amount of time necessary to re-reach or Leo and, uh, and Lin Yun to, to, to let me and come back to the same point, I can figure out that that's my equation. So we're looking at six periods divided by the period T, it's gonna give me six. Um, that was, that's how I would find my end numbers. And I can replace that into my first equation here and get that T over T2 is equal to, oh, no, multiplied by T2 minus T1 equal to T1. So n is, you understand it in this context, and it takes n amount of cycles for it to re reach back into its place. Right, so that part's clear. Then what we need to understand, another definition of n is basically, if I, if I were to chronot, chronot meter wise, if I were to time how long it takes uh, this to happen for it to reach back into phase, and divided by the number of, but divided by the period, then I get how many, Periods it took, or how many cycles it took to get back into space, right? So uh, let me see if I can find a better way of explaining that. If it took twelve seconds for this to happen, twelve regular seconds for this to happen, and each of my periods is six seconds, how many cycles did it take? Two. So that's what the T is for twelve seconds, and each period was six seconds. So you can conclude that n is equal. Okay. Uh, all right, so now let's just do some algebra. I want to isolate t, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, small t. So if I wanted to isolate small t, I'm going to get t is equal to t1 times t2 divided by t2 minus t1. And we're going to remember now that t, little the little t that we defined here, is the amount of time it took for it to reach synchrony again. Okay, that's the amount of regular time it took to reach synchrony. All right. Now, if that's the amount of that, that would be the period of my beat frequency, right? Because it's how much time it took for my beat to beat the same thing twice. So if I took the reciprocal of that, I'll have my beat frequency itself, which is what we're looking for, right? So if I took, took the reciprocal of everything, I'm gonna get that this is gonna be the frequency of the beat is equal to T2 minus T1, T2 minus T1 divided by T1 times I can separate this now because I have a multiplication of the bond. I can do T2 divided by T1 times T2 minus T1 divided by T1 times T2. And I'm getting this T2 over T1 times T2 minus T1 divided by T1 times T2. And I can cancel out the top and bottom now. So what I get is 1 over T1 is equal to, uh, sorry, minus, not equal to. One over two. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Three. 
this t represents the period of my beat, right? because it's the amount of time it takes for it to re-reach synchrony. So one divided by that amount will give me the frequency at which I'll reach synchronization. Okay. And so one over t1, well, that's just f1. And one over t2, well, that's just f2. So I have my, my proof right there. fd is equal to f1 minus f2. Again, we use sound, but it doesn't matter. You can apply this to anything. Okay. You also might need to know what's the pitch of your of your resulting freak, of your resulting wave, and you can determine that with this equation. This one, I'm not going to end up proving it, but it's essentially the average of the two frequencies. All right, so if I have, if Max is playing 400 and I was playing 404, then the resultant pitch of our, uh, of the resulting sound is going to be 400, 404, that's the average. 402, so the midway point between the two. Okay. Hmm. Max, do you want to try something again? Leah, I'm going to ask you. Let's try to do it with three, see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. So, um, Max, you play 402. Leo, you play 405. Yeah. 404. Let's play 404. See what happens. Make sure you're full blast, right? And Leo, make sure you're facing the uh, All right, so who's got, I got 400, you have 404? Two, you have 404, okay. So I'll start and then Max and then Leo, okay? So here's just mine, right? Stop your eyes, Max. I think make it an odd number of yours. Make yours 405 and then turn yours back on. Uh, can you guys hear two different beats? It's hard to tell. Because you should be able to hear a beat for this and a beat for this. Maybe even a beat for that one. Because your guys' beat frequency is going to be three. Ours is going to be five. Ours is going to be four. Or two, rather. So you should be able to hear three beats. Hard to tell. I just hear a Anyone else? Can you hear three different beats? Can you too? Ah, yeah. It's hard to tell. That's really hard to tell. All right, I tried it. Don't worry. Thank you. All right, let's do a question. Try this one. We'll solve it in a couple minutes.
Oh, sorry. Anyone know how I can make it so that whenever people's doesn't work? Yes. I'm going to have an answer for me. <clears throat> okay, take your time. Answer. Where did you go? Where did you? Fifty-seven. Thirty-seven. Yeah, you can say that. So thirty-seven thousand hertz or thirty-seven kilohertz. There's another answer there. How much? 43, exactly. So as long as it's 3,000 away, um, you'll get a few frequency at 3 kilohertz. That's pretty interesting, though. Just because we can't hear it, it doesn't mean that that sound frequency doesn't exist, right? So if the bat is playing, as, right? Uh, if the bat is going at it at 40,000 hertz, we can't hear it. It doesn't mean it's not there. We can pick it up by playing a other frequency if the machines are able to go beyond the speed of range. And so the machine, uh, the computer will play, let's say, do 37,000 kilohertz, or sorry, 37 kilohertz, and then you'll hear a 3,000 um, hertz sound as a result. And that's an audible frequency. 3,000 is an audible frequency. You won't 
hear the boo 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 because it's so fast, it's going to sound like one full tone, but you're going to hear one tone, it's a thousand hertz sound. And that's pretty interesting. And you can kind of interpret what a bass is doing by having this kind of mixer um, to help you with the beats. Um, that's it for bees. I mean, are there any questions for us? No? All right, last, yeah. Oh, the pitch would be um, um, if the bass is going at 4,000 and you're, let's say, doing a 37,000, then the average between the two is going to be 38,500. So your, your average uh, frequency that you're going to hear from those two sounds is going to be 38,000 um, frequencies, 38,500. Save this. Let's move on to um, the dolphin effect. And this is quite cool. Have you guys done this in high school? Yeah? Yeah. Which high school was that? Anyone from outside of St. John's? Did you guys learn this? Does this seem familiar? No? You don't remember? All right. I, I'm, Good news is for you guys is that I'm actually just doing it in the same detail as in high school. So you're basically going to get a retalk to you. I'm going to add a few small things, but the gist of it is the same thing. Um, so the Doppler effect, as you guys might know, actually, maybe someone can demonstrate it for me. Um, who's really good at making sound effects? Come on. Come on. My sound effects are horrible. You don't want to hear mine. When I hear, when I say Doppler effect, what's the first thing you think of? Like if you had to imitate it. Yeah. What does it sound like? You know. <laughs> it's what? Yeah. It's not. There you go. It's the new that you hear from uh, from race cars passing you. Actually, let's try to see. I think there was a, a, a really good video of a trained Doppler effect. Uh, there we go. Train. Yeah. I think it's this one. Um. Maybe you get loud. I'm sorry. That's that. That's a really obvious example of dropper effect. Um, it's a different frequency. So yes, there is the volume has to plays a role in this because as it gets closer to you, it's louder. It's um, uh, the, the the fact that it's coming close to you is getting louder, but it's also creating as soon as it passed you or past the camera, okay, you started to sound that amazing totally different. The frequency is altogether, right? And that's known as a Doppler effect. We're going to talk about it in terms of sound, but you don't need to observe this just in sound. I'll explain to you guys something that'll blow your mind, or at least it blows my mind every time I, I hear it. So if I were to ask you this question, I'm, I'm going to wait for this up. We go out of presentation mode first. So who's good at making sound effects? Leo is good at making sound effects. Um, a man or a woman are standing. Do they hear the same frequency? Why? The answer is yes, they are hearing the same frequency. But why? Or why aren't they hearing different frequencies? That's maybe a better question. You're right. The, if the, the, the first part of your same input is a bit sketch, but the second part is two. Like, I mean, like, it'll be as well. It'll be as well. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, the, the key point here um, is that the church is not moving. The man and the woman are not moving. 
Just through based on the distance, we'll hear it at a different volume, maybe. Um, but definitely not a different frequency. And the only important factor here is that nothing is moving, right? Now, if the truth was color is important to that, that's a different question. And if the man or the woman is running towards the truth, that would also be a different question. And that's exactly what the Doppler effect is. So here it is, uh, a similar diagram. Now you have a man and a woman, and this ambulance is about to run over the woman. And why is she not moving away? I don't know. But she's observing the Doppler effect anyway. Um, so as you can see, the truck, as it's moving forward, it's the same sound that is going all around. It's always the same sound in both directions, right? Because you're in open space, you play the sound everywhere. But whenever it plays one wave, it goes closer and plays another wave. It goes closer and plays another wave. So the waves end up being compressed. And that compression of the waves makes it so that you have that higher or lower frequency. Higher frequency. So this lady here is going to hear it that firing at a higher frequency than what this man is observing. He's safe though because he's behind. In fact, the truck looks like when it's past, but um, so no, they don't hear the same frequency. The woman's going to hear a higher frequency, and the man's going to hear a lower. So I want to ask you guys these questions. I'm going to go through every single possible um, combination, if you will. So I, 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 I labeled S as the sound source. All right, so with the thing that's making the sound, and O as the person or object, I guess, that's hearing the sound. Okay, so if the source is moving away from a stationary observer, does the observer hear higher or lower frequency compared to the one that's in the center? Lower. Okay, so right here, lower. Okay. Have the sound source is moving towards the observer. In that case, would be higher. What if the source was stationary and the observer was running towards, towards for that one? Oh wait, no, wait. If the observer is running away from the source, is that observer going to hear a lower or higher frequency? Lower frequency. And if he was running or she was running towards the source, it would be a higher. What if the observers are moving towards each other? Higher, very high, in fact, right? And if they're running away from each other? Oh, sorry, no, that's not true. The last question is not away from each other. The last question is in the same direction at the same speed. No change, stay the same? Is that true? Yes, it is the same. Yeah. Questions? No. Um, so sound is very special because it's, um, it's a, we learned that it's a longitudinal wave. It works by compression of sound from an air molecule. Um, I had a cool demo for you guys, but apparently it didn't work because the other class tried it and uh, it wasn't totally um, totally perfect. But imagine this, I have a sound jar, or it's not even a sound jar, I have a jar, right? And I put it on, on the table, and inside the jar, there's going to be a object that produces sound, right? And then I suck the air out of the entire jar does that thing still make a sound? No, all right, so really sound is a movement of air molecules or any kind of molecule. But if you're in an area of no problem, then there's no problem, okay? What we need to know about um, sound as well is that it travels at 346 meters per second. If I don't give you any kind of temperature, you can, um, you can go with whatever, you can go with it. Which is 246 meters per second is pretty accurate. There is a corrective value though, for second for every increase in one degree Celsius, right? So if I were to say, what's the speed of sound? Three degrees Celsius, you guys are probably scared. 346 points 
significant triggers wise, you can't do that because it still doesn't have any death toll. But you can compare this to the current. So what would the, the speed of sound be at zero degrees Celsius? Try to figure that out. Do a quick calculation. Let me know. That's 22 times 0.6. 13.2. So that would be that it would be slower or faster? Slower. It would be 13.2 meters per second slower than 340. So what does that make it? Uh, 333. That's actually pretty significantly slower. Any questions? Let's write down the answer here. Approximately 333 meters per second. Yeah. Tough question. Depends on how that number was drawn. If I if I told you the acceleration of gravity is nine point eight, it's actually not nine point eight, it's nine point eight one or something, 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 something. But because the value represents a constant, we we ignore six digits. So you can apply that same rule here. Even though we know it in more detail than just nine point eight. We know the speed of sound in more detail than three hundred and forty six. talked about this. I don't know why I have a slide on it. Do you guys want to do the derivation of this or do you guys just want to see the equation? Derivation, uh, like the proof of how we got the equation? No? Yes? Okay, some people said yes. I plan on doing it. We have time. Okay. Uh, it's not, it's not so, do I have space here? Yes. No. Uh, let's say I have an observer. Let's say I have an observer here moving in this direction with some velocity v. All right. And just because it's the observer, I'm going to call the uh, velocity v o. Not initial v. Okay? So sometimes v o can mean initial velocity. But in this case, it means the velocity of the observer. And then you have a source here. All right. And it's the source is pretty small. Okay, so I'm going to call the source is zero meters per second. So far, so good. Am I writing too small? I just because I need some space. However, just because the observer is not moving doesn't mean the waves aren't moving. And the waves are moving at some velocity. I'm going to call this velocity just regular v, and that's going to represent the velocity of sound. Right, so this wave is going to travel in that direction. This wave is going to, oops. this wave is going to travel in that direction. This wave is going to travel in that direction, and this wave is going to travel in that. Right. So if this wave, if this person is moving with a velocity v o, and this wave is moving in that direction with a velocity regular v or the speed of sound, then they're going to get to each other faster than if the observer wasn't moving, right? All right. So if this observer is moving towards here, this observer, and this sound is moving in this direction, their velocities will effectively add up. And I'm going to explain to you guys how they add up in a second. First, I want to just emphasize that the velocity of the sound, regular v, is equal to the frequency times wavelength. All right. And the wavelength is not perceived any differently. The wavelength is the wavelength no matter what. All right? So we can't change what the wavelength is. This frequency here, I'm going to call it the frequency of the source. Because that's the actual frequency that's being emitted by the source. That's, uh, that's what the machine is, let's say, is a siren of the ambulance. That siren of the ambulance plays a frequency FM. All right? That's the frequency of the source. However, we can talk about the velocity of the observer plus the velocity of the sound, a regular s, uh, regular v. Okay? 
So their velocities, because they're going in the same direction, it's effectively adding each other up because you get to each wave faster. This is going to allow you to perceive a different frequency. We're going to call this FO for observed frequency, multiplied by that same wavelength times. So far, so good. Since this lambda is the same, it gives us a convenient way to compare the two equations. So I'm just going to isolate lambda on both sides and make the two equations equal to each other. So this equation is going to become V over Fs is going to give you lambda, and this one's going to be VO plus V over FO is going to give you lambda. And you can make them equal to each other, so that's what I'm going to do. So V over Fs is going to be equal to VO plus V over FO. And now it's a matter of isolating VO, uh, sorry, FO, because that's what you want to calculate. You want to calculate what's the observed frequency of the person running towards the, um, the source. So the FO is equal to FS multiplied by VO plus V over V. Okay. You guys, does this equation seem familiar to you? Some textbooks write FO as F prime. You might have been familiar with that when it was written. How would this be different if the observer was moving in the opposite direction? My battery is in here. So, um, let me just do something. Like that. Your answer is right, Lin Yun, by the way. So if my if my observer was moving in the opposite direction, then it would be minus. Um, the velocity, right? This velocity and this velocity would be working against each other, so their effective velocity would be lower. So you'd have to make um, the observer's velocity would have to be plus or minus, depending on which direction it's going. I added a little plus or minus here, right? It would be plus if it was towards the source, and minus if it would be away from the source. So plus towards the source. And minus is away from the source. All right. I won't go ahead and uh, do the derivation for the. Um, or what if the source is moving? Because that one becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, essentially, the idea of the is the right? And it's going to be negative if the source is moving towards. So it's the opposite of what we just did. It's going to be negative if the source is moving towards the observer, and positive if it's moving um, away from it. It's going to be here. There's a trick to this so that you never have to know which one to use. You need to understand the Doppler effect in order for you to, um, to use them. Okay? So once you put it all together, we got this. This is the final solution. So the observed frequency of F prime is equal to the original frequency multiplied by some ratio that's corrected by the uh, velocity of the observer divided by the velocity corrected by the You can memorize this if you really don't understand what I'm talking about, right? But to me, memorization is more difficult than understanding. So my tip to you is that if you're supposed to hear a higher frequency because it's either moving towards you or you're moving towards it, 
you want to do whatever uh, you have to increase the numerator or add to the numerator and to decrease the denominator or subtract the numerator. Right? The right term type is supposed to be a lower position. So all you need to understand is that when it's when you're going towards the source or the source is getting towards you, go here at a higher and vice versa uh, if it's going away or you're going away. Okay. Um, my battery is going to run out, so I don't know if I want to do these. Good question. I'll let you guys work on these because I still have not enough time. There is one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about that's super duper interesting. And um, like I said, I think it's going to blow your mind. Let me just stop my recording though because it's um, my battery's running out. And if the battery runs out while it's recording, I'm going to lose the video. That's why.